So my name is Bonnie Marmer, and I am co-president of the Point San Pedro Road Coalition, and I want to welcome everyone. We're going to give a few more minutes for people to continue to sign on, um, and I'm going to um, give Alan Shavitz, our webmaster um, and our tech person here, uh, an opportunity to give you some pointers about how this meeting is going to proceed. I will be introducing my co-president, Denise Lucy, who will um, introduce our first uh, speaker for this morning, who will be Mary Sackett. Um, after that, I'll be introducing um, our Marin County District Attorney, Lori Frigoli, and our Marin County Public Defender, David Sutton. After that, we'll hear from our representative on the San Rafael City Council, Mary Beth Bushy. And last but not least, we'll be hearing from all of our hardworking and dedicated committee chairs, all volunteering to uh, improve our community in so many different ways. So um, we've got a great lineup. I'm so glad you're here. And I um, wonder if you think it's time, Alan, for you to go through some of those uh, pointers on how to get the most out of this meeting and how we're gonna proceed. Sure. Okay. So um, welcome everyone. And I'm sure we'll have more joining. Hopefully you're all fairly familiar, I suspect, with Zoom meetings at this point. Uh, this is a kind of experiment for us to do this as a meeting instead of a webinar where there's a lot more controls. Um, so um, the meeting is being recorded. We'll we'll put it on our website um, as soon as I can get it set up. Uh, you can uh, decide what kind of view you want to have. So I want to mention that, point out up in the right corner of your uh, window, Zoom window, there's a icon and a word view. And if you pick that and get a drop down, you can pick speaker or gallery view. As an example, you might want speaker view just so the majority of the screen is made up with the person who's speaking at that time rather than a whole bunch of little tiles, but that's your choice. Um, you're welcome to keep your video on or off if you wish, that's your choice. You'll be muted. You are all muted at this point. Um, the way we're gonna work it is um, if there's a point in time when you want to ask a question or make a comment, um, there's two ways to do that. One would be to use the chat function uh, at the bottom of your screen. The, the chat icon pops up and you can type in your question or comment and either Bonnie or I or Denise will scan those and, and ask those questions for you. Um, if you want to verbally ask your question um, with your own voice, you're welcome to do that to make that a control process and not a, a babble of a bunch of people trying to talk at the same time. Um, what I'd like you to do is to use the raised hand function again in your, in your, um, I'm sorry, my screen just decided to, there we go. I'm sorry, in the bottom of your screen, there's a raised hand icon. In some cases, in some versions of Zoom, it's the reactions and you get a pop-up with a raised hand. Raise your hand um, and when it's time to ask the question when there's a free moment, um, I'll give you permission to let you know that, that it's your turn and you can unmute yourself and ask your question and then remute yourself. Um, there's a closed caption icon, CC at the bottom. If you wish to turn on or off closed caption, you can do that. Um, I think that's about it, Bonnie. There's not too much more than, than that. Just if everyone would be careful about unmuting themselves at, when they're requested, I appreciate it. Great, right. all right, thank you. Um, before I introduce Denise Lucy, even before I forget, um, I just wanted to remind everybody that the Point San Pedro Road Coalition is a nonprofit. We are all volunteers. Um, we have a wonderful website that Alan Shavis runs, and um, I see some unfamiliar names and faces here today. So if you learned about our event through Nextdoor or some other, or a friend told you, and you're not on our email list, I urge you to go to our website and get on our email list so you can keep up to date on what we're doing and what's happening in our community. Um, so just a, a little promo here for our organization and to make sure that uh, everybody knows that they can learn a lot from our website. Uh, I welcome you to peruse. There's uh, lots of great information there. So um, with no further ado, I want to in introduce uh, Denise Lucy, my co-president um, extraordinaire. So Denise, take it from here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bonnie, and all of my co-board members. 
Really appreciate it. And everyone here this morning, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous day. We should be biking with you, Mary. We should be out there having some fun, right? So I just can't thank you enough for all being here today, especially I have great admiration and reverence for our public servants who are fun, fundamentally great volunteers in our community. And they give up a lot of their lives to do this. And I want to thank you for it. We are first going to begin with our supervisor, Mary Sackett. And I, again, I'll just do a quick, very brief. So Mary, you have all the time in the world to 15 minutes plus five minutes of questioning. <laughs> but uh, you've been our supervisor now uh, and you've been in, in town for 20 years with your family. We're really thrilled that you're here as an environmentalist and, and someone who has uh, had a career intersection of law and health representing healthcare professionals and building trusting relationships in the community. And all the volunteerism you've done, receiving several awards for that, we really appreciate your service all these 20 years since you've been in our, in our community. So I'd like to have you know, Mary, that you have 15 minutes plus five minutes of questions. And what I'd like to do is give you a, a signal like this. That means you have one minute left of your 15 minutes and one minute left of your Q&A. Does that work for you? Do you think that's enough warning? I think it is. If you can make it a little louder to make sure I hear it. <laughs> oh, okie dokie. I'll do my best there. I will turn up my speaker and see if I can pull it right to the speaker. Okay, cool. Supervisor Mary Sackett, thank you. Thank you so much um, for, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I am I am three or four months into my new role as Marin County Supervisor representing District 1, which is San Rafael from your corridor north to Lucas Valley um, and many spots in between kind of 4th Street North. So I'm, it, I am excited to go to work every day. There's, you know, some days about uh, eight o'clock where I wonder what I'm thinking, but um, I'm always excited to come back the next morning. And I really am humbled and grateful for so many of you who supported me um, and, you know, put your faith in me to, to represent you at the county level. I did ride my bike into the Civic Center this morning. I have um, two teenage kids who are in um, middle school in Terra Linda and asking them to be quiet on a Saturday morning seemed like a too tall of an order. So uh, <laughs> I, it's, it's great to be able to ride my bike into work and get a little bit of sunshine. I wanna um, just thank the coalition. I, you are all so lucky to have this forum and to have such committed um, friends and neighbors who continue to, you know, press the issues, connect with our office and make sure that you, you know, the, the issues that are unique to the um, Point San Pedro Road corridor are brought to the county and to the city um, and that we can continue to work together. I wanna to take a, a minute now to just introduce you to my team and Julia Reinhard is my aide who is on the call today. Um, and Julia is a recent graduate of Dominican University from political science and joined um, the office and that she's doing a great job and, and is always available um, to answer the phone. She'll drop her phone number and um, email into the chat if you have any issues. And then um, my other aide is Gustavo Gonsalves, who I know many of you have worked with um, over the years. He was also aide to Supervisor Connolly. Um, and he's also available and is, um, you know, very familiar with many of the nuances of the neighborhood. So without um, further ado, I will kind of just start with, you know, one of the, and I'm pleased that Council Member Bushy's on the call. She and I are meeting, you know, once a month to go for a walk. It's been around Loch Lomond. I'm also meeting with the mayor and the other council members. Your corridor is unique with city county partnerships um, and with a little state park thrown in as well. And so I, I think first and foremost, communication is key so that we know what each other are working on and how we can make sure that we're representing both our city and our county constituents seamlessly. And it's not always easy, but I think that starting with just regular check-in communications is, is a good foundation so we make sure that we're aware of what's going on. 
I know that this coalition's um, early days were around the quarry, and it, from what I'm hearing, um, things are in a good place. That there's communication going on regarding, you know, the three kind of major issues at the moment, which are the restoration of the wetland, um, the road maintenance and pavement, and then the air quality monitoring. Some of you may have gotten notice yesterday afternoon that the quarry is um, using trucks to deliver um, materials this morning. So I think, you know, probably will be over by one o'clock or so today, but due to an emergency repair needed in Santa Clara County, um, they are hauling rock out today. Um, and hopefully anybody who was interested in that got those communications. The China Camp Road project is an ongoing issue that I know is very important to many of you. I appreciate the letter that I received yesterday from Katie, Bonnie, and Dr. Lucy, just reiterating your perspective and the importance of this issue, which, in, which seeks to address the flooding um, along the roadway um, through China Camp. Um, we have a uh, request for proposal or an RFP going out this spring, which will look at the feasibility, including sort of the borings and what is in the roadway so we can better assess the future options and opportunities to address that issue. Uh, I wish it was moving quickly, um, but I think this is a project that is gonna take some patience uh, on all of our part and um, just continuing to move it forward. So. I'm, I am committed to moving forward on the project. And I, in fact, I met with Congressman Huffman last week and said, this is one of the priorities for our district is to just look at, we've got to look at where our state and federal funding can come together to really get the planning and that process um, moving. Um, and uh, he's excited about the project Congressman Huffman is, and we know um, Assemblymember Connolly and the state legislature is also very familiar with the project and um, hope for there some opportunities there. I'm, I, ground up community engagement is key to that project. It's, it's got a great foundation of really having engagement from so many of you, I think led by Katie and many others, um, and, and that will certainly continue. So we had a in-person meeting in December, um, and the next time we have something, you know, a decision to make, we'll reconvene that group in order to collectively make those decisions going forward. I wanted to give you an update that there that the Department of Public Works is work is going to do some repaving in your area um, over the next couple of months, some preventative maintenance, and that's going to be in the Country Club neighborhood and Bayside Acres are currently on the list, um, according to the pavement index and so forth. Now you may say there's potholes. <laughs> that need to be addressed elsewhere. And uh, there's no question that these three months of rain have really opened up so many cracks into major holes within our roadway. Um, I will tell you that if, if you have issues, and, and Julia may be able to drop that into the chat to you, if you're aware of potholes in the city or county jurisdiction, there's an online forum. Um, there's an online form where you can, I, I actually did it yesterday with the city on one near my house, you drop exactly the location and from all the reports I've received, those have been patched really quickly. So let, let people know. Um, and if you're not sure if it's city or county jurisdiction, reach out to our office and we'll help navigate that. But um, there's the long-term maintenance and then there's just the immediate thing. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on homelessness and people experiencing homelessness. I know we all see it every day. It's, um, and we, many of us think of what that's like during the rainy season and the cold season and, and how can we just address this issue. Um, I wish I had a quick and silver bullet to address the issue, but I, can, I don't. <laughs> what I do know is that we have a robust long-term um, steady process within the county revolving around um, whole person care and housing first. So um, since we began that process, we've, we have housed 583 people, 94% of those remain stably housed. 
We continue to add beds for, our home, for those people experiencing homelessness. We increased the number of beds in the county by 10% between 2021 and 2022. And we're in line to do the same 10% increase within, um, within this next year. So there's a number of projects that opened this year. Jonathan's Place, which is in the canal area of San Rafael, which really bolstered the, um, that facility that was formerly Mill Street. And that was a big collaboration, city, county, um, and Homeward Bound as the operator there. And then the Casa Bueno project um, in Puerto Madera also came online this year. What we expect in the coming year, um, the 1251 South Elysio project um, will have 40 beds of permanent supportive housing and that will be opening. Um, it got a lot of press and a lot of media and we're, that will be opening um, this year. And you know we are working so that that is a seamless project that doesn't have impact on the community. And then 3301 Kerner, which is the conversion of a office space into um, permanent supportive housing. Uh, again, a big collaboration with the city and many others that will be opening um, within the next year uh, or early, it, it could be 2024 um, before that one opens, um, but that will be housing 40 folks as well. So it's, um, there's not a silver bullet, but we continue to work on that issue with a lot of support and collaboration across the county. Uh, wanted to touch on sea level rise as well, which I know um, your corridor has various low spots and then in addition to the China Camp Road. And we're really looking countywide at how we address the number of low spots, but also critical infrastructure that is in areas that we expect to be subject to sea level rise. Um, on, on the other side of China Camp, the Santa Venetia neighborhood, um, we're working slow and steady to replace the flood wall there, um, starting with some FEMA grant funding and, and getting that project moving forward. And we're looking, um, and I'll get to it in a moment, but we, we've got some budget talks coming up and we're looking at creating a sea level rise unit within the county that that is a cross departmental approach. Because the way I really see us preparing for sea level rise is the infrastructure costs are, are astronomical, but what can we replace? What can we pay for and upgrade and really look with a sea level rise view when we're replacing any infrastructure and repairing? So looking at that, the big projects right now are this are Stinson Beach um, adaptation plan. And if anybody's been out there since the January storms, it looks like a completely different place. There used to be that boardwalk that you would take down from the bathrooms onto the beach. It is now a um, overcrossing. It is not even on the beach. The beach is gone. Um, and many of the homes out there suffered a lot of, of damage. Um, so I think Stinson Beach is where we're gonna see these things um, first and foremost. And we saw a lot of damage in January. For anybody who I've talked to before, you know that climate um, is really is a very high priority of mine. A couple of uh, updates there. The county did pass a reusable foodware ordinance um, that's now in effect, which applies to you know businesses and takeout places um, having reusable rather than plastic um, utensils and other accoutrements. So that that will, is in effect now in the unincorporated areas of the county, in addition to Tiburon has also adopted that ordinance, San Anselmo and Fairfax have similar ordinances. Um, and, and then that will begin to be enforced in November. The county also passed an electrification ordinance. So as of the first of the year, all new construction um, will be um, electric, will be all electric. And we can't talk about climate without talking about transportation, which is the key section of our emissions within this county. So I am very involved in a number of transportation issues in the county. I'm now gonna be serving on the um, 
Transportation of Authority of Marin Board, which is our local um, congestion management, Marin Transit Board of Directors, also the SMART um, Board of Directors, which has been interesting, and, also, and finally the Great Redwood Trail Agency, which is a really cool project looking to make a pathway from the Oregon border to um, San Francisco Bay uh, along the former um, uh, rail line. And there's a lot of pieces of that happening. In Marin, it's really the smart multi-use path and then going north, pieces of it are coming together, but that is will be a world-class 320 mile pathway that I hope to be able to hike um, in my lifetime. So it's it, it, there's a lot of big pieces, but but many of them are coming together. And then we've gotten some very significant um, transportation dollars recently and news about those. Um, in particular, the RM3 money, which was the bridge toll increase a number of years ago that's been locked up in litigation that was recently released. And so $130 million there will go into the fix on the 101-580 interchange. And I'm sure many of you are aware of. We'll also put $100 million to finally complete the Marin Sonoma Narrows, the last section of that project, and then $100 million um, to continue working on the Highway 37 solutions. I'm very committed to closing the gaps that we have in our bicycle infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure for those folks who want to get out of their cars and to provide that connectivity. And I work on those projects a lot, including in very involved with the San Rafael Safe Routes to School Task Force, where we're looking at a lot of projects. I'm not sure of any in your corridor right now, but we're focusing at the moment between the Meadows community, um, which is kind of Los Ranchitos, into um, the Civic Center and connecting that neighborhood. Um, Turning the page to disaster preparedness and fire preparedness. I, I had an opportunity to talk to John yesterday. I know he's on that committee of this group and I know you all have worked for a long time um, on vegetation management and preparedness for your communities. And we really appreciate all that work. I think that's how we survive the disasters that um, you know are, are inevitable these days. Um, through the passage of Measure C and the creation of the Marine Wildfire Protection Authority a few years ago, we've really seen a lot of work happening in the community. And I feel like this year with the rains, having more fire crews local um, and not fighting fires, we've really been able to tackle some big issues there. So I wanted to let you know that there's more um, opportunities for vegetation management. Um, not only for if you have a neighbor who, who just can't get on top of it or may not be um, able either financially or otherwise to tackle some of the um, flammable materials removal, there's now um, more support through the, the, the JPA in order to help communities do that. They're currently working in uh, Upper Lucas Valley and, and Lucas Valley doing a lot of the median work and so forth. So um, I think I'm, I'm getting close to time, Dr. Lucy, so I'll just finish a couple other things. But if you want any of that dis defensible space assistant or assistance or information on that, please reach out to us and we're happy to make those connections. And finally, starting on Monday, the Board of Supervisors will spend three days in budget workshops and really looking at the county's um, $716 million budget, um, how different departments are spending those dollars, where our priorities are, and then in June we will, you know, make the decisions about um, um, finalizing that budget. But if you have any input, please let me know, reach out, send me an email, or else you can um, appear at public comment um, 9 a.m. on Monday and share your thoughts um, with the entire board. So I want to leave ample time for for questions, and um, I, but I also want to end with just the note that we are here for you to help you navigate county government, and uh, we'll work city government and other um, any other entities. And so please know that we're here as a res resource. We answer the phone, we respond to emails, and if you have any issues, big or small, or great ideas or complaints, please reach out. 
So with that, I'll open myself up for questions. And before we uh, do that, I think I want to apologize. There was a little glitch. Um, and I think people couldn't put questions in the chat um, for you, or there may have been a problem. So um, your a Julia uh, sent me some uh, information about how to reach uh, your staff and where they go. So I'm putting that in the chat for everybody. I hope uh, that's going to work. Um, and there you go. That was provided um, by Julia. Thank you, Julia. And um, and hopefully now people can uh, submit their questions so everybody can see. Uh, and or they can what they can raise their hand uh, using the little icon at the bottom too. So Supervisor Sack, Sackett, you have seven minutes. So we've got a couple extra minutes for your Q and A. I'm ready. <laughs> Sam Hoffman, good to see you. I think you're on mute, Sam. There you go. There we go. Uh, my name is Sam Hoffman and I live on 78 Marina Boulevard. And um, we have uh, a couple of rehabilitation centers that have moved into private residences. One is a teen rehabilitation and the other one is a potentially, I think, a sober adult rehabilitation center. And I was wondering if anybody in this group has any experience with uh, these rehabilitation centers in their neighborhood and what effects it may have on the neighborhood. And if anybody wants to raise their hand to, to respond to that, to Sam's question, please do or drop it in the chat. And, and Sam and I spoke yesterday and we, I bet I have been talking to the folks on Marina Drive. There is a paradigm treatment facility moving into a home there, which is six, um, six people. My understanding is that will be 18 to 24 year olds experiencing anxiety or depression for about a 30 day um, um, treatment in a home setting. And the county does not have the ability to regulate um, those settings when they're, they're six people or less. They're treated you know, more akin to a single family home. But what we are, we are able to do is work with the provider on good neighbor policies. So if there's issues regarding parking and there's issues regarding um, circulation or flow or lighting or fencing and some of those things, we can address them. And these have come up um, over the years across the county. Um, they open, they close, um, but we always try to make sure that to ensure that we have a direct phone number um, for whoever's operating that, that so that neighbors can work through the issues. So we're pulling together a group on Marina Drive to meet with the provider and to answer questions so everybody knows who they're dealing with. But um, I think Sam's question was a little broader of just do others have this in on their streets and, and what are the impacts? I think there have been others in our area. So I, I imagine people will be reaching out to Sam to uh, share some information. So thank you, Sam, for that question. Um, I had a quick little question, if you don't mind. I didn't see another hand raised here. So um, uh, do you mind if I just ask it about the electrification? So okay. if, uh, about new homes, is that just new homes uh, does it, can you just tell us if it's homes that have already received uh, permits or, or that haven't started the permit process? How, do, how does that work? So it's, it's projects that would submit a plan, a building plan, um, anytime after January 1 uh, or of 2023 um, have to be all electric. So uh, really hoping that the new development that we may see in this county over the next decade is is certainly falls under that. Um, 
the retroactive part of it is much more complicated as far as switching things out um, for those of us who you know have have the built environment, which is most of Marin County. I will tell you that in um, that the Marin it's or not the Marin BACMED, which is the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, a week ago did pass um, new rulemaking that says when you switch out water heaters um, and um, and home heating systems that those will need to be going to all electric. It's a long phase in um, and one of, you know, over really the next decade, I don't have those numbers right in front of me, but that is coming from the regional and the state level. And we're seeing similar actions by the state. There's a phase in and one of the things I liked about the back med rulemaking is they are really keeping a close eye on the market to ensure that what they're mandating folks to do, that the market op options are there um, as those things go into effect. But nobody is going to have to, you know, replace something at this moment. Um, it's just when you're looking ahead to replacement of switching from natural gas to, um, to electric. Wonderful. There was a question asked in the chat from Betsy Saunders about the uh, speed on the uh, Point St. Peter Road and when the next speed test will be taking place. I believe that question will be taken up by Kevin Haggerty, our roadway chair. But um, if you want to address that question, Mary, you're free to do so. Kevin may know more about it than I do. I do not know when the next speed test will be done, but I am happy to look into it and get back to Betsy. I don't know. Okay. It looks like Michael is raising his hand. Yeah, I am sorry. I was joined a little bit late, but um, I'm relatively new to um, the Country Club neighborhood and just wanted to ask, um, in light of the um, clearing of Albert Park, uh, are there any thoughts about you know, I know there's already panhandling on Third and Irwin um, and Grand and some homeless, you know, showing up there. Do we expect that the homeless will migrate to those to that area from Albert Park in light of the fact that they're being cleared? And how is that going to be managed? And, um, you know, my daughter walks sometimes to downtown and, uh, you know, she's, you know, kind of been, um, you know, a, you know, confronted, I guess is the right word. And, um, you know, just trying to figure out what's the strategy for Third Street, Irwin Grand and the panhandling that's happening there. Thank you for the question, Michael. Um, and I know Council Member Bushy will probably speak to this as well, because that the Albert Park and Grand are in the city jurisdiction. But my understanding of the issue is that, you know, everybody in the Albert Park um, encampment was offered um a bed uh not all of them took it uh and you know just making sure that there are resources out there but not everybody wants to take those those services and this is you know it's an ongoing it's an ongoing issue and i wish that we had a solution um that would take care of every you know person experiencing homelessness um but we don't have that um we don't, you know, it, it, people are in homelessness for a variety of reasons, uh, and some of them, you know, don't want to go to congregate shelters. Um, we don't have enough beds for every single person, so we we do have, you know, try to discourage panhandling, et cetera, and directing folks to use other agencies if they want to um, donate to folks who are on the streets. Um, and I'm happy to have a deeper dive discussion with you on that, Michael, as well. I did cover some of that earlier, and I'm not sure if you heard it, but happy to, to reach out and have a, a further conversation. Okay, thank you. And if the council members have any other additional comments, that would be helpful. I'm sorry I joined late, so I'll circle back with you, Mary. Okay. Okay, our time. Uh, whoops, or time's up. <laughs> We actually have run out of time for questions. Can we take one more? Maybe make this the last one. Nobody has a uh, yeah. I, I, I think we're out of time. We're actually getting running a little behind. So I want to uh, keep on track here and um, 
thank uh, Supervisor Sackett so much for her time and uh, really appreciate her covering so many issues and and bringing us up to date on all things county and even some beyond the <laughs> beyond the jurisdiction and touching on some of those overlapping problems that plague both the city and the county and we we understand that those complex uh, issues are are tough to for everybody to tackle and we appreciate all your efforts. Um, Thank you. What Yes, thank you. And uh, before we go on to uh, Lori Frigoli and David Sutton, I did want to acknowledge that you mentioned vegetation management. And uh, thank you for giving us the nod for all of our work. We've been doing weed pulls in this area since 2005, off and on, but in recent years more frequently. Um, and we uh, are going to be having another one. Uh, and that's coming up on April 29th. We, we just finalized plans yesterday. We haven't even sent out the announcements, but those that are here today can mark their calendar for the morning of April 29th for our annual uh, Earth Day, um, not exactly on Earth Day, but Earth Day um, associated uh, weed pool. And we hope you can join us for that. It helps keep our community safe. So thanks, thanks again for that. And thanks for acknowledging uh, the hard work of our volunteers in keeping that going. And please see um, if Supervisor so, Sack and put something in the chat for everyone. Uh, ah. on green building requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of good information. All right. Um, so next on our agenda, um, I am particularly delighted to welcome both um, District Attorney Lori Frigoli and Public Defender David Sutton. Um, I personally have known both of them for a very long time. Um, I was a public defender for many years in the county of Marin, and uh, some of my first uh, jury trials, um, uh, Deputy District Attorney Lori Fagoli was my opposing counsel. And um, there are a few uh, district attorneys uh, and um, public defenders that have really positive um, relationships. It's usually kind of a, a little bit of a conflict there being opposing counsel, but I'm happy to say um, uh, that I'm today introducing my friend, former colleague, former um, opposing counsel, and, um, and the current uh, district attorney of the county of Marin. And uh, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll let her do her seven minutes and then introduce public defender and former colleague, uh, David Sutton. Uh, and then they're going to uh, field the questions together um, during their during the joint time. So uh, I'll let Lori get started, then do a quick intro for, for David Sutton. And uh, Lori, it's your turn. All right. Thank you, um, Bonnie. Can everybody hear me? Because I put this headphone on, so I'm hoping it's working now. It's, it's not very loud. Okay. How about now? Well, better. All right. Let me take it out then and see. Oops. Yeah. I'm sorry, speak again. I'm going to go back to this one and just try and keep my voice up. How's that? All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, Bonnie, thank you. That's I really appreciate your kind words. Uh, we go back a really long ways. Uh, I am starting my 33rd year in the DA's office. It's been my honor to be the elected DA here. Um, I have a prior interesting background that many DAs do not share, and that is that I was a police officer and I literally um, grew up in, in San Rafael and my husband and I, our first home that we purchased was on Main Drive right off of San Pedro Road. So I have spent uh, much of my adult life out in your neighborhood. I appreciate and respect all that you are doing. And so today, um, I really appreciate that I'm sharing this with David Sutton because we have a mission, which I think we both share, which is to really break down some of the misconceptions that we do as part of our service to you, our community. And so when I was elected, my uh, vision and my statement was to connect the community to the courthouse. And I had several people ask me, what does that mean? I said, it means sitting here in a church in Marin City or a community meeting or in a school as I did this week and explaining to people what the DA's office really does because people uh, still continue not to know what we do. And that's my job as your servant to explain to you what we do. So the first thing um, <clears throat> I would tell people is you are welcome to go to our website, marincountyda.org. There's a beautiful video there. It's a whiteboard and it's a 
three to five minute uh, explanation in whiteboard fashion of all the duties and obligations of district attorneys. And so I encourage you to do that. Check out our website. We have all our data out there as far as the number of arrests that come through our office, the number of prosecutions that we um, and decisions that we make throughout the year. We have that data going back five years and we have data uh, as in 2021, not 2022 yet, including the race of the people who are being prosecuted for crimes. So I wanna talk about some of our initiatives and one is um, to let people know what we're doing. If you come to our front lobby, which I welcome you to do in the district attorney's office, room 145, the former sheriff's office uh, there in the big blue roof building. Um, when you walk into our front lobby, you see something that you don't see in any other DA's office in the state. And instead of pictures of all the people that uh, held the position before I did, you see pictures of our really values and what we stand for. We have a welcoming sign in Spanish and English. We have uh, signs to honor our uh, eternal a mission to stop hate in our communities. And so by that, we support Not In Our Town. That's a nonprofit, a national nonprofit. And um, so we have uh, Marin Stands United Against Hate in Spanish and English posters in our office. We also have posters, uh, a poster from Lisa Christine, an internationally known photographer who takes pictures of human trafficking victims on all levels, whether it's labor, or slavery or sexual um, human trafficking. She has made it her mission to take pictures of people in those situations. And so we honor her and our commitment uh, against human trafficking in our front lobby. And we also have two informative posters from Moms Demand Action and Brady um, for safe gun legislation. So we're really proud of um, two collaboratives that we have very involved in in the county and one of the most important ones is our Marin County Gun Safety Collaborative. We meet quarterly. Uh, we were involved in the gun buyback uh, that where we got more than 500 guns off the street last year with the help of Mayor Kate, who helped us get the financing for that. So um, we hope to be able to do that again, but right now we don't have the bandwidth for that. So community safety is one of our main priorities. Um, a couple of our initiatives, which you can find out about if you look at the budget book that uh, Supervisor Sackett was talking about, and that budget book has the initiatives of every county department, including mine. Um, so you can look at that and see what our vision is for our different offices. So a couple of interesting things that people don't know that we're doing as far as transparency, uh, which all DAs really should be looking at and we are we are almost ready to implement a program called race blind that is a program where when reports come into our office police reports for consideration we get about 7000 of those a year and we're uh, continuing to stay on course with that number of submissions we want to get a program in place where we can redact any information in a police report that's being reviewed by one of my DAs for filing of charges we want to redact any information that might a result in a bias, whether it's implicit or any other kind of bias on behalf of my staff. So that would include eliminating the race of the person, where it happened, where the crime happened, could even include uh, include the person's color of their eyes, the officer that arrested them, the agency that arrested them. So in the olden days, there was this program called Dragnet. I'm probably dating myself, but uh, Joe Friday would stand there and talk to a witness and say, hey, ma'am, just the facts, just give me the facts. And so we're really going back to that kind of old school um, reality that in order to eliminate bias, we need to really be transparent about that. So a DA will make a decision, a filing decision in a case without looking at that bias, potential information and make a decision and document it. And then the information that's been covered up will be revealed to the filing DA. And that will include all the information I mentioned before, in addition to the person's criminal history. And um, if the DA changes their filing decision, they have to document that. So from the minute a case comes in our office, we are going to be transparent about who we're prosecuting. And if there is some bias that is seen later on, we've documented why why we made the filing decisions we did. The other initiative that we're uh, close to implementing is called Measures for Justice. That will be looking at cases after we make the filing decision. So the cases that we do file, um, they will help us track the race of the people, what happens to their cases, what agencies the cases came from, what the disposition was in those cases. Um, so you could literally have that kind of data in your hands 
as a community member on the DA website. And so that information you could look up and say, hmm, how many uh, Black people did the San Rafael Police Department arrest for drunk in public? And what happened to their cases? And how many white people got arrested for drunk in public in San Rafael? And what was the outcome of their cases? And so that really is putting the data in the people's hands, which is, in my mind, where it belongs. So that's one of our initiatives we're working on. And I think it's important to, for people to know, we do a lot of this work with the public defender and our justice partners. And David's gonna talk about that in a minute. And I think it's really important for us to continue to break down the misunderstandings and I think misconceptions about our work. We have um, restorative justice courts for drug treatment, mental health treatment. We have a veterans court we're so proud of um, and a domestic violence court that we work on. And so we do all these things together in the same room at the same table. And so we really like people to be aware of that. One other thing that I will talk about before my time is up is that um, we have a hate crime investigator in our office and an immigration relief uh, specialist, uh, Jerry Coleman, who I think is on this meeting. If not, you, I know you know him because he's your neighbor. Um, and we work with the public defender and providing immigration relief for people who find themselves in the system. We look at past cases and current cases. So I think that's a quick little overview of what I wanted to say today. And I'm going to turn it over to David for him to uh, say his remarks, and then we can answer your questions. So thank you. Thank you, Lori. I, I appreciate all that you did pack in a lot. And I want to remind people uh, of a couple of things before David gets started. One, uh, that you can create a closed caption here if, if you uh, uh, want to track along with closed caption. That's at the bottom of your screen, depending on their kind of computer. And also, there will be a video available of this. And so if you came in late, you want to see what happened before um, or replay any part of what any speaker said, um, there's going to be a video posted on our website. So um, there's a lot of information to absorb. Uh, so we have tried to make it easy for everybody. Um, so now I'd like uh, David to... Uh, inform everybody about what public defenders do and what he's doing as our new head of that office. He's been in, in that position for a year now, um, which um, is great. And I am so pleased to welcome him when uh, he was first in the office. Um, I, I, I was uh, doing felonies and he was doing misdemeanors. Um, and that was, a, that was quite a while ago. And since then, He's come a long way, and I'm so um, pleased that he's here today. I don't want to take any of his time, and I'll let him take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so real real quick before I, I jump into it, I, I really want to laud uh, Lori's office and the district attorney's office uh, for leaning in for blind charging uh, and measures for justice. To give context, uh, there's only one other district attorney's office uh, in, in California, Yolo County, who actually engages in this. And it's not just providing data to our constituents, the citizens, right? It's really actually taking a focused look at the data and seeing, you know, if law enforcement is in fact being biased and how how charging decisions, arrests, et cetera, how that's being used uh, specifically, you know, communities of colors, disparate impact, et cetera, and, and really, uh, you know, taking measures to, to address that. So, you know, that is, that's huge. Uh, and I, I think it, it, it helps the community overall. It instills trust in law enforcement. Uh, and I think it should, should instill trust in the larger community. So I, I really want to thank Lori and her team for, for leaning into that work. It's really great work. Um, as, you know, as, as Bonnie pointed out, you know, I, I am the, the public defender. I'm not elected. I'm appointed uh, by Supervisor Sackett and other members of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, you know, traditionally, I, I don't know if many of you know what a public defender does, but traditionally our office uh, and public defender offices across the state provide uh, free legal representation for individuals who cannot afford counsel. Uh, Gideon V. Wainwright, uh, you know, celebrated its 60th anniversary last weekend, uh, and, and that's kind of our, our charging orders. Um, I like to say that we have the largest criminal defense firm in uh, Marin County. Uh, we have a, a staff of 45, 29 attorneys. And, you know, a large part of our work is, in fact, litigating criminal matters with the district attorney on the other side. Uh, but, you know, like like Lori's office, we do so much more. And I'm really proud of the work that this county does collaboratively, uh, especially amongst the, the community criminal justice partners um, to really address and, and engage in a different kind of, of you know, I'll, I'll just call, 
crime prevention, right, is really changing the lives of individuals who are mostly stuck uh, in the criminal justice system and either safety valving them, them out of that system in the first instance or addressing underlying issues uh, that, that caused criminality in the first instance. Um, so, you know, one, uh, Lori alluded to it, we, we staff a collaborative courts or many collaborative courts in the county uh, that, that involve a team, right? Uh, treatment providers from Health and Human Services, the District Attorney's Office, probation, our office, uh, mental health and drug abuse treatment, uh, like an adult drug court or veterans treatment court, right? Individuals who have been charged with criminal offenses often have been convicted, uh, but really rolling up our shoulders, getting buy-in from those individuals and doing the the, the, the very hard work of rehab, rehabilit rehabilitating individuals. Uh, so it's not just, you know, uh, one of my attorneys has worked out a deal. Uh, you've pled guilty. You're on probation. Good luck to you, sir or ma'am. Uh, you know, it's it's leaning in and making sure that people have the tools uh, to succeed and can overcome the you know past issues, uh, PTSD uh, for veterans, uh, drug and mental health issues uh, in adult drug court and our Star and Magic mental health courts. Uh, additionally, and I think what what we're most proud of, or at least my office. Uh, is more, most proud of it, and I, I know Lori uh, shares shares uh, the belief in it, is our clean slate program. Uh, most counties have a clean slate program, and what that traditionally is, is a public defender works with former clients or individuals who have uh, historical convictions to clean up their record, right, to uh, expunge and seal prior criminal uh, convictions with the hopes that they can find housing, uh, if they're dealing with housing instability, resources, uh, employment, et cetera, right? And kind of just we've expunged your conviction, good luck, right? Same thing. Uh, Marin County tackles that head on. Uh, and what we do in, in you know, kind of our slogan is taking the Civic Center to the community. So every quarter we have community uh, clean slate events targeted at the different uh, council areas or supervisor areas. Uh, and so like Marin City, Canal, Northern Marin, uh, West Marin, and we go out into the community, the public defender's office, district attorney's office, probation, health and human services, uh, and community-based organizations. Uh, and we, we give wraparound care. So uh, my office will do intake uh, and address individuals' historical uh, criminal convictions, uh, clearing those convictions. If that individual is on probation, uh, the probation department will provide spot check-ins and discuss um, you know, early termination of, of, of uh, probation or probation supervision, but also provide vocational and job, job training skills. Uh, health and Human Services, County Health and Human Services is on hand to provide benefits and also, uh, uh, you know, support both with job and, and again, uh, vocational training. We've partnered with mental health and drug and substance abuse coordinators, as well as Career Point North Marin uh, and the Adult Education Consortium, that's a mouthful, uh, to get people uh, into adult education, if there's a lack of education, uh, you know, so it's it's full wraparound services, not just you know come to the public defender's office. Great, you've had your 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 record expunged. You should travel across the county to go see you know one division of health and human services, right? Uh, additionally, you know the district attorney's office staffs their immigration attorney uh, as well as their their victim witness advocates, right? So if uh, an individual has been the victim of a crime or wants to talk to someone they can have that confidential conversation uh, in their own community, right? And it's not a trip up to uh, the Civic Center, right? So, you know, we're, Supervisor Sackett was talking about transportation. There are transportation gaps in this, this county. And, you know, the trip from say the canal or Marin City or West Marin, frankly, uh, to the Civic Center, that's an all day event. And if you're an individual, uh, my clients, they're, they're largely, you know, uh, living on the margins, uh, have little resources, taking a day off of work that they barely have to travel to the, the Civic Center, that's huge. Finding childcare, paying for childcare, that's huge. Uh, so the real aim and the goal is to to provide our services in the community. Uh, in addition to, to these quarterly events, uh, the office and the partners, we, uh, we, we staff a table at St. Vinny's Help Desk in San Rafael uh, every third Wednesday. Uh, providing the services uh, to community, unhoused community members, as well as uh, at Ritter, Ritter Center's drop-in center and uh, the encampment uh, in Binford Road. We've done spot events out in West Marin uh, and also have an immigration um, attorney who provides uh, information to, to undocumented individuals living in the community who works with Jerry Coleman hand-in-hand 
uh, to, to figure out uh, effective ways to avoid either deportations or if there was a, a conviction that resulted in um, their potential deportation, revisiting that uh, and ensuring that community members are safe and secure. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, we talk about crime prevention, law enforcement, that work, I, I truly believe, uh, goes goes far to ensuring that we have a safe community, to lowering the numbers of, of both prosecutions, arrests, et cetera, because we're, we're tackling issues of poverty, issues of homelessness, uh, and giving people a chance. Uh, so I'm really proud and, and honored to work in this collaborative environment uh, with Lori, with Marlon Washington, our probation officer, uh, and health and human services, services and community-based uh, organizations as well. Um, so quick overview, uh, and I, I think I made it in under seven minutes. Might have gone over. Defense attorneys are long-winded often. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, David. I, I, that was great. great. There's been so much happening since I uh, retired from that office, and I'm just delighted to hear about all the wonderful initiatives that have uh, come to pass that I wish we had had when I was there. And uh, it's really exciting. So um, thank you for informing um, our community about the good work that everybody um, in my former workplace and uh, your, your office is doing and your collaboration with the other criminal justice partners. Um, I think there is a lot of um, misinformation out there and, and a lot of people who don't really understand how it works. So it, it's really important for um, for our representatives like Lori and, and uh, people like you to come in and uh, get everybody uh, to better understand how, how it all works. And um, I wonder if there are any questions. See anything in the chat right now. Um, don't be shy. Yeah, right. Yeah, um, there's... Hal Shenson just asked a question in the chat. Okay. Um, guess it was to me. Uh, bravo, or maybe it's a comment. Bravo to Bonnie and Lucy for including Lori and David to the program. Great to understand what those offices do. So a comment. Thank, thank you, Hal. That's nice to hear. I'm glad that you appreciate it. Um, yeah, there's, there have been, um, I don't know, uh, Sometimes comments I see in, on Nextdoor, people complaining about things. And so people people care and people are outspoken. And sometimes they say things that make me want to pull my hair out. <laughs> so, uh, Bonnie, I would say um, one thing is, you know, I live in Novato now, but um, and there is a um, mental health treatment facility very close to my house. And I um, see people who are residents there frequently in my community. And I would just say, and I know David and you know from your experience, there is, as far as the situation with having treatment facilities, especially for youth in our communities, there is um, a blight. There is There are so few resources for youth to get mental health and drug treatment. And that is one of our primary concerns watching these children already. It was such a difficult life for them. And then they have gone through COVID. We are seeing so many situations with mental health and self-medication and um, drug use and abuse. And um, I've been to so many forums where I have heard young people say, why when my friends get in trouble, do they all have to go to Idaho or some other state to get treatment? Why can't my friends stay here where I can see them? So I think um, I think it's just important to be mindful of that. These youth are our future. And if there are situations, I know law enforcement is always aware and partners with some of these community providers to keep the community safe. So um, I think it's just important to have kind of an open heart and mind and really paying attention to what's going on in our community. Um, and I get that some people don't want that in their neighborhoods, but you know our world is changing and we have to address some of these situations if we wanna stay safe and um, help raise our children safely and support them. Thank you, Lori. To, to echo Lori's comments, and, and I, I believe Samuel Hoffman uh, had a question about uh, uh, you know, treatment providers within you know, small residential homes. I think two things, one, uh, you know, assuming that these the the operators are are uh, good actors, right, and that they're abiding by rules, they have a structured uh, placement, uh, and they're really you know monitoring uh, their their facilities. 
uh, that's a net positive, not only for the neighborhood, uh, but for the larger community, right? Because especially in terms of individuals and, and young young individuals uh, who are dealing with mental health issues or drug and alcohol issues, these are kids from our community, right? Uh, and we want to avoid uh, them becoming my clients. I, I, it's not really a joke, but I, you know, in, in, in board presentations, I want to reduce my caseload. Right. If I have to have the uncomfortable conversation of having to deal with staff layoffs because the number of cases or the work isn't there, that's, you know, that's a positive thing. Right. Um, not positive, obviously, for the, the laid off staff and it hasn't happened yet. But, you know, that that, that it's an investment in our community. And I think obviously there is the fear and, and, and the potential, right, that something could happen, right, that, uh, that an incident could happen in the neighborhood. But. I think you have to see and view it as a positive uh, in the first instance, again, assuming that the operators are, are good actors and, and really uh, invested in making sure that their program works. Uh, but this is this is something that that will change not only the individual's uh, life, but I think the greater community as that individual hopefully works their way out of treatment uh, and, and rehabilitates and reintegrates. Thank you. I, I can't tell you how many um, neighbors I met from our area who came to court to support their kids who had, you know, had issues. So it's 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 our own community that is being helped by these, and um, I'm sure um, that we all have known somebody who's had somebody in their family or friends that has has needed help at some point. Um, there is a question in the chat I'd like to um, ask. It says. Uh, uh, to that end, this seems like an interesting subject to engage our schools with social justice. Do Lori and David see an opportunity for educational programs or talks about these issues? I think if you um, ask around, almost every school in the county has um, restorative justice practitioners, not only youth within the youth classes, but also um, from a program called Youth Transforming Justice. Uh, run by Don Carney, which was formerly Youth Court. Um, and so I think our schools are really doing a lot of equity, diversity, and social justice work. And I think it's really important to support them. And that might be an interesting thing for you all to hear about from the schools themselves. I think that's what the, the driver of the question was. So that would be my comment that um, it's really impressive to see what these youth are doing to help each other. Um, and uh, additionally, most, well, Lori, Marlon Washington, our probation officer, and uh, Benita McLaren uh, and myself, the director, Benita McLaren, the director of Health and Human Services, we sit on the School Law Enforcement Partnership Board, uh, which meets uh, in person quarterly, but there's uh, always work that's being done in the background. Uh, and that is all schools in Marin County uh, discussing information regarding drug use. Uh, disciplinary issues, uh, potential rise in either, you know, vandalism, violence, et cetera, and coming together again in a collaborative spirit and, and discussing and figuring out how to best deal with these issues. Also, uh, you know, social media uh, and, and potential exploitation of sexuality there, as well as, as drug and alcohol. And what's scary is, is pill use uh, in the county amongst our, our high schoolers and, and hopefully not our middle schoolers. So, uh, you know, there is work that is going on uh, that both Lori, myself, um, and your your uh, community criminal justice partner, those departments uh, are, are really engaged in, uh, and leaning into. Uh, also, I, I believe RX Safe Marin, which is a sub part of Health and Human Services, uh, forgive me if that's wrong, you know, is, is really leaning into the work uh, surrounding uh, pills, uh, fentanyl, and pill use uh, amongst high schoolers. So it's, it's now called. OD free Marin. Um, and yes, they're in health and human services and really doing great work on pills and the fentanyl crisis within the county. There are a couple of hands up. Uh, first, uh, Maggie Phillips, if you'll unmute, you can ask your question. Maggie, you're muted. There we go. I was having trouble there we go. unmuting my iPad. Um, speaking to the uh, issue of a dearth of programs for young people, I wonder if uh, there is any connection with Alcoholics Anonymous with the Al-Anon um, groups. Are there any in Marin or Sonoma counties that either of you know about? I actually, when we had um, 
the RX Marin when they they had a huge forum uh, over at Embassy Suites because they now are OD Free Marin. There were actually two representatives from AA and they wanted to find out how they could get involved. So I'm hoping if there are current programs, I'm sure there are, I'm just not familiar with them, but they really want to be a part of this initiative going forward to really look at fentanyl and alcohol use and abuse. But I, I'm not personally aware of them. I'm sure there are. Uh, where would be the best place to look in your opinion for those? I've looked online and, and it seems like since a lot of those Al-Anon groups particularly are volunteer led, it's just hard getting volunteers. I'm sure Marlon Washington, or if David doesn't know, um, our juvenile, um, he's the head of our chief of our probation department and he covers probation for adult and juvenile. So I will get that specific answer for you. And um, if Bonnie, if you can get an email or I'll put my work email in there and you feel free to remind me to follow up on it. And um, maybe you might wanna meet these two people who were at this meeting that I was at because they were also going to come to my uh, juvenile justice and delinquency Preve prevention um, commission that I'm on and we've yet to hear from them. So, um, and that's, those meetings are open to the public. So maybe I'll share that information. With Thank, you. Well. Thank you. Thank you, David, David might know. Uh, I don't know exactly, um, but I would say Health and Human Services website uh, has a pretty robust landing page, I think, for substance abuse treatment and, and um, alcohol treatment. Uh, that's obviously, I think, geared a little bit toward, or it's geared towards adults, but contacting those service providers or even reaching out to Health and Human Services, um, they may they may be able to steer you in the, the, the right direction. Um, we have a case manager who works in our office, uh, Daryl Rory. He may know of, of some some services as well. So I can put my I'll put my email in the chat as well. So if you want to reach out, I can connect you or get an answer uh, and get back to you. Uh, one last question, I think, and we'll move on to another subject, right, Bonnie? Kathy Keller had her hand up. Uh, Kathy, if you will unmute yourself and ask your question. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, one of the um, unique issues I think we have at the Point San Pedro um, area is the vulnerability to incomers from other counties, um, either doing um, vandalism, robbery, catalytic converter theft, drug sales at the transportation center. So um, is there something proactive that's going on in the DA's office that is able to help protect us from that. I know all of my neighbors are getting have cameras, but when my neighbor's um, uh, gas tank was drilled into and drained um, in the middle of the night, his camera didn't pick up enough of a um, an image to do anything about it. So file reports and reports, and um, I'd like to know if there's some other proactive thoughts that you have um, to protect you know, all of us, elderly and um, the youth. For me, that's a really difficult um, question. I'm on next door daily and I see um, the complaints and it's, it's difficult because you don't know when somebody's driving their car down the street if they're from Marin or they're not. And there is a huge push um, against racial profiling. And so officers don't just stop somebody on the street because they look like that car doesn't belong in the neighborhood or the race of that person might not fit with their perception of what who should be in that neighborhood. So it's really a hard, it's a hard thing to, to answer. And this is happening everywhere. And the, the important thing is when we do catch these people through people's um camera systems, there are some neighborhoods like Belmar and Keys, they, that neighborhood got together and have their own um, in community um, video surveillance, basically, that catches license plate readers, much like they have in Tiburon as well. So that's one thing that a community might want to consider after a crime is committed to go back and um, allow law enforcement to look at that information. I mean, there's only a few ways to get in and out of in and out of your communities. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is just be a good neighbor and look out for your neighbors. And if you do see something that is suspicious, um, you should report it. But Mill Valley just did put out a study that you might wanna look at. And um, it, they found that there was a very high disproportional report of suspicious people in neighborhoods. And it um, a lot of it seemed to be race-driven, that it was profiling by community members in their homes. And so 
you know, it's a hard situation now. The sheriff and other um, law enforcement are under intense scrutiny for traffic stops and why they stop people for different reasons. And many of our communities have a very high number of people who commute from out of county to work. But um, the other thing too is we, you know, we are vigilant when people commit these crimes and we don't uh, make harsher dispositions because a person is out of county, but we do want the word to get out. You come to Marin County, we're gonna hold you accountable for your conduct. And hopefully the word will get out and continue to get out. But um, some of these crimes are just really easy for people to, um, commit unfortunately so that would be my kind of response to that just be a good neighbor uh but also be mindful of when you call the police what it's about but maybe look at the video camera situation thank you i appreciate um your time this morning giving up a saturday morning especially in lovely weather and uh giving all this great information to our community so um Thank you, uh, Lori Fagoli and David Sutton. Um, and we uh, wanna let you go on with your day. I, you're not with our community. So um, if you wanna sign off, don't feel bad and <laughs> go on with your day. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. And thank you, Dr. Lucy and Bonnie for organizing this and taking yeah. care of your community. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Take care. I think, Denise, you're going to introduce Mary Beth. Yes, it's my honor to do so. Council Member Bushy is for District 3. You've demonstrated consistently your commitment to building community. I mean, you've been on the Peacock Gap HOA for 15 years. You served there. You've been on the, you were on the Planning Commission for nearly 15 years. And you've been elected again for your fourth term. Thank you for stepping up to do that as our City Council Member. Uh, prior to, uh, professionally actually, Mary Beth practiced public utility law, utility law and also was appointed as the California Public Utilities Commissioner for administration, Administrative Law Judge, and she became an expert in mediation. She's demonstrated her unwavering commitment to public safety and to ensuring that our first responders have the resources necessary to keep us all safe. So we want to thank you. Uh, Council Member Bushy for being such an active community leader and such a great neighbor. Thank you for being here today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I have a slide deck, but before I get to that, I want to circle back to an earlier question um, and actually um, an earlier comment that um, uh, Supervisor Sackett had made. Um, so the, the question um, was about panhandling and homelessness. Um, and those two issues kind of got conflated. So I just want to tease them apart, first of all, um, and, and, and focus um, first on homelessness um, and homeless people on the street. Um, uh, Supervisor Sack talked about the budget process that the county has initiated, and there'll be meetings over, I think, the next couple of days, as I as I recall, the uh, not the next couple of days, uh, next week, uh, during um, the first days of the business week. And I really want to encourage everyone to participate in those budget meetings. If you think that um, additional resources need to be brought forward for the um, people experiencing homelessness who are on our streets, um, who won't avail themselves of the existing programs, who might need different programs, who need some sort of outreach, um, if you think that additional resources should be brought to bear for those people, then the health and human services budget is the, uh, for, of the county is the place that you should go and let the county supervisors know that, um, that you would like, um, as, as, as many of us would, additional resources on the street for the people that are on the street experiencing homelessness and for whatever reason, cannot avail themselves of the existing resources. Um, so our, the, our, the day is coming for those dollars to be allocated next week by the county. And um, if you want more on, uh, on the street homeless um, services, that's, that's the place to go to the health um, and human services budget. Now, switching gears a little bit to the panhandlers. And when I say panhandlers, I mean, um, you know, the, the barefoot guy who stands by the um, utility pole and 
at, um, what is it, third and grand um, all the time. Um, those people are here for money. They are often not experiencing homelessness um, and are often um, doing rather well. Um, the reason they're here is to get cash. Um, we have heard that some of them describe their activities as my ATM. Um, this is what they do to get cash. Um, we can't do much about them because of the, of, of, of the First Amendment. There are a couple of areas around the edges um, that we can make an impact on, one of which we've already done, um, and that is to prohibit panhandling in unsafe areas. I mean, if you look at the narrow median um, in front of uh, Montecito Square, um, there's a little sign up there that says panhandling is not allowed, no, loiter, no loitering is allowed. Um, we passed an ordinance to do that specifically to get people out of these unsafe areas. Um, we've done all that we can for safety reasons um, to prohibit um, panhandling. Um, so that's, that's one thing that we can do about it. Um, also, um, if the panhandler is behaving in an unsafe way, um, you know, sometimes they'll run out into the streets um, and knock on your windows and stuff like that. If that's occurring, then um, law enforcement, in this case, the San Rafael Police Department, um, should, should be contacted so that um, safety issues can be addressed. But a person just standing on the sidewalk asking for money um, is, is not something that we can stop um, from a governmental perspective. But as residents, um, the most important thing is to stop giving them money. If you don't give them money, they will not come. That the reason they're here is because we're their ATM and we and we keep giving them cash. Um, and you know the problem is us. Um, so we need to stop doing that. Um, if you feel compelled to give them something, give them food um, or um, give them information about where they can get the help that they, they claim that they need. So anyway, just to recap, if you're interested in um, homelessness, um, the budget is going to be set next week at the, by the supervisors for the Health and Human Services. Um, so I, um, I'm, uh, I emphasize uh, Supervisor Sackett's invitation to join those, um, join those budget discussions. That's where um, that's where the um, decisions for the county are going to be um, are going to be addressed. So um, I just want to jump into a, 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 a quick slide deck, Ellen, if, um, if you're ready. There we go. Here we are. There's me, District 3. We are District 3. Um, we've um, in San Rafael, we are now in we have we've had our first election in the in the district format um, and we are well settled into our districts, um, we're District 3, roughly East San Rafael. Um, district 2 is uh, basically West. Uh, district 4 is North. And District 1 is um, essentially South of uh, the Canal and part of um, Bret Hart. Next slide, please. This, I, I um, am going to focus on this slide because this is how you can find out about what's going on in San Rafael. Um, if you have not subscribed to our city manager's update snapshot, um, I um, absolutely encourage you to do that. It comes out twice a month and tells you everything that's going on um, in San Rafael. Super, super helpful. Um, and there's even a contest. Um, you can win prizes. It's fun. Um, the Third Street Construction Project update. Um, that, that project is huge. It's causing all sorts of traffic issues, um, but it's going to be so great when it's done. Um, and our awesome public work staff um, is doing a, just a phenomenal job of keeping everyone informed about what's going on. There's weekly updates that come out um, so you know when things are going to be particularly bad or maybe not bad. So really encourage everyone to sign up for those, um, those updates so that you can receive those. Um, the last thing, reporting an issue to the city. There's an online portal that opens up a ticket and the tickets get monitored so you have to get a response. I can't encourage you enough to use this online portal. I, I've used it myself. It works like a charm. So this is these are the best ways to um, stay up to date with what's going on in San Rafael and to communicate um, with um, the awesome employees that we have at uh, the city of San Rafael. Next slide. Speaking of awesomeness, <laughs> Fire Station 55. Um, last week we moved in, um, so there, the, 
The construction is completed. Um, they've moved in. There's some details that um, are, are, are still being ironed out um, with, um, I think there's a punch list of some kind, but um, they've, they fixed the address. I saw that. So that's good news. So it's not the point of San Pedro Road anymore. Um, and <laughs> We are super excited um, uh, to be completing this. This is phase two. Uh, uh, Fire Station 55 was in phase two of our public safety revamp um, that started actually the measure that funded the rebuilding of our public safety um, buildings was adopted in 2013, which was also an auspicious year because that was the year I was first elected. So there you go. Um, but as you, the, it has taken us 10 years to get here, but wow, what we've done. Um, I hope you've all seen the um, new public safety building um, down um, downtown, Kitty Corner from um, City Hall, you know, awesome modern facility. Um, really happy um, that our, our first responders have, um, all, have all of the resources that they need there. Um, that was part of phase one. Phase two were these um, last uh, uh, fire stations of which um, 55 is one. So very excited about that. Um, and the word from Public Works though is that they're going to need to keep that lane closed for another couple of months as they finalize um, the building. So just um, just be prepared to, um, to, to deal with that closed lane uh, for a little bit longer. All right, next slide. Moving on to um, one of my favorite topics. I am on the city council's um, library subcommittee and I wanted to brief people on um, what's going on with our libraries. We've got, we have some good news, immediate good news um, and, so, and some, I guess, longer term um, good news that um, we want to talk about. First of all, our downtown library. Um, which is a beautiful building, although it's, um, I think, 120 years old. Um, we've gotten uh, a state grant of $3 million to fix some of the infrastructure in the, um, in the existing building. Um, we have all sorts of um, roofing, HVAC, um, it, all manner of problems um, in that building. In fact, um, I don't know if any of you have been down to the downstairs um, children's reading area, that area is a converted garage. Um, and we're hoping to use some of these funds um, to reconfigure where the location of things are in the library, including moving the children's area upstairs into the, um, in, in, into the sunshine and uh, maybe putting some um, more of our tech um, supplies um, down in the downstairs. So um, we're looking forward to um, getting um, the project underway to um, update the the, the existing downtown library. And the next slide, um, I don't know how many of you have been out to our Pickleweed um, location. That, we've got uh, $2 million to upgrade that um, location. On a square foot by square foot basis, that branch of the library gets the most traffic. It gets the most use. So that's why we are um, expanding it um, and using the $2 million to redesign it so it can be more useful to, to our patrons there. Um, and I don't have a slide on it, but I just wanna remind everyone that there is also a sort of a pop-up um, library out at the um, Northgate Mall. And that is also a very popular location, uh, more so for our, our, our neighbors in North San Rafael. But if you find yourself at the mall, um, it's, it's a fun place um, to go. They have, um, some uh, displays and interactive things that, that you can, um, can do at that branch. Um, and the next slide, well, now we, do, we transfer to the future of our library. Um, we've been working for the, well, gosh, probably since I've been elected to um, at the city council to come up with a way to do a, a large scale project um, to um, bring more library resources to the city of San Rafael. We have, we're under libraried um, on a square foot basis by about half. We should have about twice as much um, space as we do. And we, and we, um, and we have a library that looks nice from the outside, the Carnegie, however, it is over hundred years old. Um, so it's not, um, 
you know, it, it was literally built when there were horses and buggies in front of that building. That, that, <laughs> that, yes, and that's 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 the image that I I like to say. You know, there were horses and buggies when the building was built. It's a great building, but we need something for the next the, the, for for our children and, and a vision for our future. So that's what um what we are on. Um, uh, focusing on with the new library uh, subcommittee. So next slide. Taking you back to where we started. I want to remind you, this is how you get in touch with us. This is how you keep up with what's going on with San Rafael. So sign up for Snapshot, sign up for the Third Street um, updates and use the report and issue um, function on our website. And I think that's it. That's it for me. Um, that's it for my prepared remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, we are so far behind. So let's see if there's okay. some questions here and try to move on. We have lots of information from our, um, our committee chairs that people want to hear about too. So thank you so much, Mary Beth. That was very informative. Questions, questions. Wow, I see none. So maybe we should move it forward um, because we do, like I said, have a, a lot of, uh, am I missing any questions here? Okay, all right. Um, with regard to, thank you, Mary Beth. Um, we really appreciate you giving up your Saturday morning to be here with us. I know you had other things you wanted to do today. And so thank you again and for bringing us up to date on all those important issues in our community. So. Um, yes, yeah, so um, now to our hardworking committee chairs, we have a great crew here, and um, I want to start off first with Dave Crutcher, um, who has um, a report to us um, on the rec quarry. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, the quarry update will be quick and cover just a few um, familiar issues. Back in 2021, the county approved an application to extend its operating permit another 20 years beyond uh, 2024. And during that, that whole process, we at the coalition uh, provided some comments on a few issues, including the marsh that sits between the roadway and the entrance to the operational sections of the quarry. If everybody drives by it, at least if you get out in the quarry direction, you drive by it every day. And uh, we also commented on air quality testing and road maintenance and a few other issues as well. Um, as recently as this past week, we met with quarry management and continued to make progress on those issues. And as for the marsh, our concern has been that, that the marsh has been slowly deteriorating due to inconsistent water flow in and out of the marsh. Um, the quarry has been receiving advice from its environmental consultant in recent years on how best to restore the marsh, which the quarry is required to do under its operating conditions. Um, but we thought that it might be helpful to get a second opinion, something of a peer review on the quarry's current marsh restoration plan. Uh, the quarry was receptive to that suggestion. And we both agreed that Stuart Siegel and an environmental consultant who lives in the area uh, would be a good hire for that project. Uh, the quarry has since engaged Stuart to produce a report on the current plan and how it might be improved. And uh, Winifred will have some additional comments on that in her wetlands committee report that's gonna be coming up. Um, as for air quality testing, as very quick background, the quarry completed an air quality testing project it was required to undertake a couple of years ago and found no substantial problem with air quality around the quarry. The county, for its part, um, retains authority to re-implement an air quality testing program if conditions suggest that it, it's needed. Um, but the coalition's concern has been that there are no clear standards for when air quality testing should resume. So we're in discussions with the quarry to come up with some, um, some sensible triggers probably relating to production levels that if tripped would require a resumption of air of air testing. Um, those discussions are in fairly early stages, so it's going to take a bit to work that out. On road maintenance, um, you know, the, the main road is going to need to be resurfaced in the relatively near term, and the coalition has had some concern that a remedial slurry seal might compromise some of the road noise abatement properties that were engineered into the roadway when it was fully redone about 10 years ago. Um, we're still looking into that, but it's been suggested that the slurry seal may not 
compromise those noise reducing properties, may even improve it a bit. So um, more generally, we want to we want to be sure that the road will be maintained over the decades as the quarry operates through its extension period. And for now, um, we understand that repaving is going to be delayed due to the recent work on changing the lane format on the road, which we're all aware of. Um, but the coalition will work with the quarry and the county, and I guess the city as well, to be sure that the road is maintained effectively as the quarry trucks take their toll on the roadway over the years. Um, finally, uh, as an FYI, and as Supervisor Sackett previously mentioned, the quarry is operating today to respond to an emergency in Santa Clara County. Um, that's going to, I guess that's all related to some recent storms. Um, we're told that it should be about a half day project, but there will be some additional trucks on the road um, today. And my understanding is that that should end today. So that's the quick quarry update. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate all those um, details that uh, give a good picture sure. of what you and uh, the rest of the quarry committee are addressing. So um, next, uh, Winifred, uh, our wetland committee chair. Um, I know she's got a lot to talk about. Okay, well, thank you, Dave, for that update. And I'm Winifred Dejani. I'm the chair of the wetlands committee. And uh, we just feel so fortunate to have wetlands spread throughout our community because with the ever diminishing green spaces, there's such an important habitats for so many species of wildlife. And of course, the most evident of these are just the immense variety of birds that are either migrating through here or they're here year, year round. And it's just, you know, it's really a treasure to have them. And they also provide so many environmental benefits. They sequester carbon, they filter the water. And so we work to advocate for these spaces in efforts to conserve and restore them and also in hosting educational events to just make people more aware of their value. So uh, regarding restoration, Dave already touched on this, but I'm just going to revisit it um, as part of one of the three items that the quarry committee is engaged with the quarry on is the 55 acre, that's the largest parcel of wetlands in our community. And those are the Dutra quarry wetlands. And um, one of the things that the quarry has agreed to do is to get a peer review on its current uh, restoration program. And they did it, engage Dr. Siegel, Stuart Siegel, and we're very pleased with that because he is a professional certified wetland scientist. He has extensive experience restoring wetlands in proximity to this area. And so we're expecting him to have uh, his plan completed at the end of April. And at that time, we'll sit down with members of the quarry and discuss what he's come up with and review that in the collaborative spirit that we're pleased to see developed between the coalition and the quarry members. And then regarding educational events, we've hosted several webinars and field trips in the past and our most upcoming one, which is next Saturday, and we're very excited about that, is going to be a field trip entitled Birds of Our Local Wetlands. And we are going to tour the Loch Lomond Marina. Hopefully the connector will be open then, but if not, there's still plenty of birds like to see. Beach Drive Inlet and just our local surrounding areas and our guide is going to be Rusty Scalf from the Golden Gate Audubon. And Rusty, he's been an educator and a birding field trip leader for decades. He's just uh, a great source of information, extremely knowledgeable. And he has been volunteering in the annual counting of the Vox's Swifts since its inception. And he also volunteers with the Audubon Breeding Bird Atlas. So he just has you know, so much to offer and to enlighten us on. And this event, it filled up immediately, but if you're interested, uh, it's very possible that some people might drop out. And so put your name on the wait list and we will contact you if that happens. So can you if you- your, Can you put your uh, information on how to get on that wait list in the chat when you're finished, please? Oh, sure, yeah. And so anyways, if you love the environment, if you want to get involved with our wetlands, we always welcome new volunteers and participants. And there's always something you can do to like further this 
important issue. So you can go to our website and just contact us, send us a, an email and we'll get back in touch with you. And so on that note, I'm going to let Kevin Haggerty have the floor. Uh, and, thank you, Winifred, for that update. One other thing, when you're at the website, as Winifred suggested, check out under resources, check out the um, YouTube channel and you can see the recordings of some of those wonderful educational programs that the wetland committee put on. You can learn about our wetlands. You can learn about the birds in our area, all recorded programs on our YouTube channel. So thank you, Winifred and Kevin, take it. Good morning and thanks to all of you for coming to the meeting today. My name is Kevin Haggerty and I'm chairperson of the Roadway Committee. And I wanted to share with you a, a information on a couple items. Um, the, the city and the county will soon be conducting a speed survey on Point San Pedro Road. This is required by California law to, to be done every five to seven years and with the results determining what the speed limit should be on the roadway. The city is the lead agency on this, and they are in the process of hiring a consultant to do the survey, not only for Point San Pedro Road, but for other locations within the city that in which surveys are required. The coalition is hoping soon to be able to schedule a, a webinar in which we would have uh, representatives from the city, the county, and the San Rafael Police Department available to discuss what this survey is, how it works, and how the speed limits are determined. Without a verified survey, the uh, it's not really possible to do enforcement on the road. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the medians. As you know, the uh, a number of years ago, the, an assessment district was was passed by the vote by the residents out here, and the city contracts. As a result of that, the city contracts with a company to maintain the median. So they not only contract with them, but they supervise that company um, to, to maintain the medians. Um, the current work on the medians includes um, uh, uh, adding, uh, adding additional plants, which will be installed within the next month. And also they're doing some mulching work. As, the mulching work is down at the other end, but they're moving east on the roadway and you'll see more mulching as time goes by. Um, I have received a couple comments or actually I also want to um, praise um, the chairperson of the median, uh, Jim Dixon, who's here with us today. He's done a wonderful job working closely with the city. But Jim and I have received uh, recent comments regarding drainage issues between Peacock Drive and Maine. We're working with the city uh, to resolve this issue. Um, also, I one of the things that's helpful to Jim and myself is that if you see or have any concerns about things regarding the medians, if you could contact us, and if you go to our website, there's, there's a place where you can uh, send an email to me as chair of the Roadway Committee, and then Jim and I will work closely with the city in getting you an answer and, and resolving the issue if possible. Um, another item is the condition of the road. Uh, we're, we're working closely with the county and the city on uh, roadway maintenance issues. Um, I, know, I know that there are some concerns that parts of the roadway need to be repaved. And as I think uh, Supervisor um, pointed out earlier in the meeting, there are plans to repave parts of the road sometime in the near future. And we're continuing to work with them closely. A new initiative um, that we're going to be working on during this next year is what we call the sidewalk clearance project. Again, we'd be working closely with the, the city and the county. And I think if you use the sidewalks along the roadway from the high school all the way out to, to um, Bisgain, uh, you'll notice that there is oftentimes uh, vegetation growing over the, the, the sidewalks or bushes or um, uh, pebbles and gravel. So we're, we, our goal here is to work with the county and the city to set up a, a program whereby uh, either they or the property owners 
um, would be responsible in a timely fashion to address those issues. So more on that as we develop. And then finally, um, during the next or next few months, we're going the coalition's going to have have an effort to add new members to the roadway committee. We want more representation of the neighbors neighborhoods along the roadway. And there's a lot of issues, so we, it'd be really helpful if we could get more represent, representation on the roadway committee to address, address those issues. So more on that soon. Bonnie, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, thank you. Just one clarification. Did you mean to say repave or re-slurry? Um, I, I meant a slurry. I, my understanding is that the the, the goal of the, the county and the city would be to re -slurry, slurry coat parts of the roadway. However, there are places on the road in which they'll have to repave or fill potholes before they can slurry coat. Yeah. Okay. So they have to repair and then re slurry. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just to clarify, thank you so much for that. And um, I think. We need to move on. We're behind schedule here. We've got lots more information. I know people are anxious to hear from Alan Shavitz about the marina. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, and certainly there's a lot of people that are frustrated with the fact that the uh, breakwater connector, that's actually called the breakwater access trail um, that connects the parking lot to the breakwater itself has been closed for such a long time. And why hasn't it been open? So let me give you a little background. Um, I've been, I'm chair of the uh, Marina Committee uh, that basically meets with all of the entities that are involved in that development. Uh, Bi-monthly now, it was monthly, we've moved to bi-monthly. Uh, that means the Trumark, the developer of the, of the residential housing that's still being constructed, the Strand, which is the existing HOA, and Basic in terms of representing uh, his ownership there. Um, Safe Harbor Marinas that owns the marina, the city of San Rafael's community development department and department of public works. We all meet, um, I host or lead that meeting on a bi-monthly basis to try to get everybody to work together and move the project forward. Uh, we've been pretty successful in a lot of ways. I've been involved in this project since its inception in 2000. So you can imagine if there's anybody who's frustrated with how long this has taken, um, I'm, I'm leading that charge at 23 years. Um, in terms of that breakwater access trail or BAT, um, that was scheduled, it was being rebuilt because BCDC and the city demanded, required the developer at that time, Marina Village Associates, Associates who still has that responsibility though they don't own the property anymore, um, to rebuild that area, to have it protected against high tides and king tides uh, when it was getting inundated and, and destroyed. Uh, they're near completion on that construction. It was scheduled to be completed in December. Obviously we're now in March and it's not quite completed yet because of those heavy rains that we've all been experiencing. I think you have delayed this. construction. Uh, Henry, could you turn off your speaker? Thank you. Um, that um, one of the things people say, well, nothing seems to be going on and why isn't it not open? One of the reasons, which is not so visible, is that the de decomposed granite path is not finished. It looks like it's finished, but it was finished uh, with a flat surface because construction was still going on and the developer, uh, the contractor, wanted to keep it flat or it would be damaged even further by machinery and equipment, people um, doing their work. Uh, when finished, that uh, path would have a slight mounding effect to it so that water would run off. Uh, that still has to be done and be completed. It is in the final stages of that. Last status from MVA was that they hoped within the next week or so that that would be completed and open. Another restriction was that that work and the work on the playground is under a single permit. Legally, they're not required to open that uh, to the public until that permit is cleared by both BCDC and the city. Um, it's not been cleared, but both those entities have given permission to MVA to open the BAT, the, the access trail, in advance of, of full completion. And uh, they're certainly intending to do that as soon as they get the last pieces of work done that they need to get done. Um, that's probably the 
most. You know that the construction on the housing has been postponed. The finishing of the units that have not been started yet has been postponed by Truemark because of economic conditions and lack of market. Um, so that will be remain in a, in a uh, construction situation for a little bit longer than otherwise expected. But we're working on certain aspects of that to make sure that areas that public access uh, is needed is opened in advance. So that's pretty much my status. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, uh, next up is um, disaster prep, which is a huge issue and has been a very, very active committee. Um, John Lenzer has done a terrific job since taking the lead on this. And I want to give him time to tell everybody about what he's been up to. John. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, pleased to, to represent our committee uh, today and tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Uh, obviously, there are a number of disasters that could befall us. Fire is, is probably the most likely. Uh, we live in a, an area with a lot of uh, vegetation that borders on our residential areas. Uh, with fire, uh, we are focusing primarily on training, um, and having one hour to get ready kind of uh, training sessions put on by the fire department. They've put on a number over the last few years. We started out having them in person and then we had to go to Zoom. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that as we move forward into this coming year, that those sessions will be again live and uh, we will get more people to attend them. But everybody should be prepared to evacuate their homes if they're ordered to do so and have a go bag in their car and and be ready to move. Um, so that's been our, our major concern in the fire area. Now, the other has been vegetation management. Um, and as as Bonnie mentioned, we're going to be testing a, a, a weed pull on Earth Day, uh, April 29th. And you can uh, make sure that, that the Coalition has your email address. You'll be notified of the opportunity to participate in that. Um, and that will be coming up. Fire, however, is, is not uh, the kind of disaster uh, that we're uh, buying supplies for and really preparing for. Fire is always such that it's localized and a lot of agencies come in to focus their resources on it. And the public agencies can address it from the forest service to the county, to the city. Uh, and concentrate their their efforts there through mutual aid agreements. Uh, we're also worried about a broader type of, of disaster, and that's earthquakes. If there's a general earthquake in our area, everybody's going to be in the same boat, and we're going to have to live with the resources that we have in our local communities. And for us, up and down Point San Pedro Road, that means uh, we have one fire station, uh, Station 55. And it's generally staffed with two or three people at most. And we could end up having that as our total public resource for days uh, following a major earthquake. So we've been preparing to sort of be on our own following an earthquake until outside resources can arrive. Uh, we've spent over $20,000 on both rescue supplies and medical supplies that would be available uh, to first responders and to volunteers that would work in our area. Uh, these supplies are in two areas. One, uh, they're stored at uh, San Pedro Cove in a large garage uh, there. And second, uh, trailer has just been purchased. I don't know if you can see this. We're, we're, uh, we bought this trailer several months ago. We're in the process of uh, furbishing it, uh, putting signage on the side of it. And we'll be having some work parties uh, by our committee in the next few months to get about half of the supplies into that trailer. Uh, the trailer can be moved around and we'll be parking it in several different areas uh, from where station 55 is over to uh, the marina, Loch Lomond Marina, and maybe out to, to Peacock Gap Golf Course. But it will be available to really concentrate those supplies where we need them. Uh, I'll just finish up by saying anybody who's interested in joining our effort uh, they can log on to the coalition's website and communicate with me that way. Or I have a very easy email address, john at lenser.com. So if you put my first name, an at symbol, and my last name, 
I'd be happy to send you information and have you uh, attend our committee meetings. So john at lenser.com. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll finish up. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate that. And last but not least is Katie Miller. She is um, our uh, our lead person on the issue of uh, the roadway through China Camp, which is a fascinating project and important to our community. Um, Katie, let everybody know what you've been up to. I'm happy to do that. Actually, Mary did a great job. Um, so I'm mainly going to thank a number of the other people that have been so important to this. Uh, first of all, Mary for her support uh, and su excellent summary uh, during her presentation of this critical project. Um, I'd also like to say, uh, thank Winifred and John for attending the last, uh, the December stakeholder meeting where they address the uh, China Cap, the, per the China Cap Road is being so critical to our own evacuation an emergency response should San Pedro Road become impassable, and also um, it creating the access to our beautiful unaltered wetlands in, uh, in the park. Um, finally, I'd like to thank the DPW, the county DPW staff, and Stuart Siegel um, of the, in this case, in his role as the director of the San Francisco Bay Near, and all of the other very engaged stakeholders um, for helping to identify uh, and assess project alternatives. Um, it's really been a marvelous thing to be a part of. Um, it's, the sessions have been extraordinary, just extraordinary, very much a bottoms up process um, that I think all has really uh, been a remarkable experience for all of us can, uh, involved. Um, if anybody has uh, wishes to have a, Additional information, there is some on our website. Um, I believe it's under, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's under disaster prep, uh, the, the disaster prep section, or feel free to contact me through the, uh, uh, through the website and I'm happy to um, bring you up to date. Uh, we don't have another meeting scheduled just yet. Um, but again, happy to uh, engage with anyone in the community because as Mary said in her presentation, in the long run, it's going to be community support that makes this project a success. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. I think uh, we, uh, I'm so impressed everybody has stuck with us. Uh, we're way past when we thought we'd be done, but there's been so much information here. We have a great uh, community. Um, we have great um, elected and appointed leaders, and we are um, committee chairs and community committee members have all been so hardworking. Everybody uh, is um, what makes this all work. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Denise, did you want to give the final closing here today? Well, you said it all so well, Bonnie, and really appreciate you spending your morning with us. So I hope you can get out there and hit some golf balls and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thanks all. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.